Greetings everyone, so nice of you to join me. Thank you for your time. Today I'd like to talk to you about the subject of focusing. Now there's two sorts of focusing we're usually thinking about or talking about, and that is the video autofocus, and uh, then there's the uh, focus of the camera when you're taking a photo. And uh, it's really the photo focus I'll be focusing on today. Excuse the pun. So we're going to pay attention to that and we'll look over some little details and of course there will be some tricks and tips and bits of advice. Now I want to apologise up front if it sounds a little condescending to say uh, let's talk about focusing as if that it seems like such an elementary thing to have mastered. But unfortunately I've, I'll have to be honest with you I've looked at a lot of my friend photographers as well and just general uh, pictures that come up on Instagram and Facebook and the like and I've noticed that a lot of people who are should be more competent at taking photos will often post out of focus photos and to me personally I can't think of anything more irritating and annoying and also very uh, disrespectful for the subject you're taking the photo of. For me I would much rather not have any photos and post nothing than post a blurry out of focus photo of someone. I think that's showing a real lack of respect for them and you're not obviously doing your job correctly and maybe you need to work on a few points. So again I'm not, this is not about names, it's not about individuals, it's about the general situation that this actually occurs quite a bit. Uh, particularly noticeable when uh, someone is very busy. So they may be at a function or a venue or a big convention and what's happening is they're going from like one photo to another very rapidly. So they might do groups and a single and couples and then move into a different area and the lighting's changed and they're major, making all their settings adjusted and of course what's happening is they're not paying attention to maybe one detail and that'd be the most important detail, acquiring focus. So yes, composition is essential, lighting is very important, and uh, making the uh, posing of the model uh, spot on is also very important. But if you've uh, messed all that up with an out of focus photo that's all blurry, we have really wasted your time. So there are several things that we can do to improve our focusing skills. Uh, I tend to not use I detect focus very often, not because it's no good. In fact, it's quite remarkable with the use of uh, video. The new Nikon cameras are actually quite capable of video autofocus, and finding that eye is something they do reasonably well, so I'm quite happy. And if you've got a Z9, of course, it's not just doing it very well, it's doing it exceptionally well. So why wouldn't you use it? But for me personally, my comfort zone is actually selecting the video or photography point of focus myself. So I'll let it go on to autofocus for the video and have a lot of confidence. It will track the face or eye of the subject, and that's not too much of a problem for me. I mean, let's face it, with uh, video, the subject's always moving. So you're not going to be able to be in control of that yourself. You can't go around moving the little focus point following a person around all the time. That's just too difficult and too consuming. And also you're going to introduce maybe blur and shake to your image that you don't want, it's not welcome. So uh, in the video aspect, yes, let the camera do all the work for you, trust its autofocus, uh, just make sure you've got your settings right first, make sure that uh, if the subject isn't moving, something like what I'm doing right now, I'm stationary in a, in a chair, and you're using video, well then make sure that you use that small box arrangement over their face, and that the camera will not be distracted on other objects in the room that it might think are eyes or look like eyes. So uh, that's a way of actually focusing and concentrating the focus point down into a small finite area of the subject's face and that's a wise thing to do if they're not moving around. Obviously if they're moving around a room and there's a lot of action going on you just got to use the whole screen and uh, let the camera do its thing finding the faces. But getting back to the subject at hand which is the photography focus uh, I just put a little uh, clip up over this to show you how I like to do it. So we're just looking at the back of my camera now, the Z7, and I'm just going to illustrate to you how important it is to pay attention to little details. For example, I tend to use for myself not so much eye detect, although that is an excellent option. I like to actually physically choose the spot where I want my uh, little icon there, little spot to be over the eye. So once I've got it in its exact position and I'm very comfortable with it, and it usually takes a few seconds because it does move around the screen very quickly. Once I've got it in position, you notice the box is red. Now when the box is red, it means it hasn't acquired focus. So when you press the shutter button halfway down and you gain focus, you'll see it actually go green as it is now. Now once it's green, you know it's safe to take the photo and that photo will be very sharp. So just don't be in too much of a hurry when you go to get everything in position to take the photo. Pay attention whether or not it's green, the little box, it's changed colour, or if it's still red. If it's uh, still red and it hasn't changed colour, then you're in all sorts of trouble if you're expecting to get a sharp photo. So just take that time, make sure it's green, actually look at it to make sure it's green through the viewfinder, and then when you're confident it's acquired focus, 
then take your photo. It uh, seems a simple and very obvious little detail, but believe me, those little things make so much difference to whether you're gonna have a sharp image or not. So in the rush of the moment, you can just wanna click the button and get it done, but uh, please pay attention to the spot being exactly over the eye or wherever you should want it, the target, and then also make sure that it is changed color to green and it has actually acquired focus. So let's just look at this one more time briefly. Here it is green, that's when you take your photo and not when it's red. So I uh, hope uh, that's some help to you. And you see there that uh, I tend to do everything manually. So just picking up this very same camera that I was illustrating then, I like to uh, you know choose my little focus point with my wheel. I can use this wheel here. Or the little scrolly wheel is actually better. The wheel up the top is uh, much more uh, advantageous because I think it moves very uh, fast and is also uh, extremely uh, easy to position in point. So it goes to the focus point you want very quickly, little dot. And then of course, once you've got it in there, make sure that everything's turned green. Once that box is turned green, you can take your photo. You have absolutely confidence you've nailed the focus. That's what I prefer to do. Now some might even want to do manual focusing. I think that's pretty uh, insane for most most uh, situations. It's very very good if you're doing macro photography and you've got something on a uh, got your camera up rigged up on a tripod for example then that's probably definitely the way to go. Uh, but if you've um, got a subject where you may be moving around yourself and changing posing positions, changing locations, well then I find the autofocus is great because it just stops. There's one less thing you have to worry about. But there are some things we can do to make sure that we're not mucking that up. Now, back, let's go back into the old DSLR days. Let's forget about the mirrorless system for a moment and all its uh, masterful computer hardware. Let's uh, go back, say, five to ten years and assume we're shooting something like, uh, if we're talking Nikon, maybe uh, a D810 or a D4, D5. Now, even if it was right up to a D850 or D6, they're still DSLRs and they all have the same uh, inherent situation. So how can we help ourselves in that DSLR mode to uh, take a good photo? And let's, let's say something here on this. I love the DSLRs. I reckon they were magnificent. I had the D810, D850, and I thought they were wonderful cameras for taking photos. Not so excellent on the video but definitely amazing for taking photos. In fact, some of the sharpest photos I've ever taken were with the D810 and the D850. So it was a brilliant arrangement. I think actually without the uh, uh, sensor uh, stabilization, you get a little bit sharper image because it's not constantly uh, moving around maybe. So it might be a uh, little bit uh, sharper in the old DSLA, DSLR days because of that. I haven't had a lot of chance in comparing the two side by side, but I will say that I, I did really always get razor sharp and accurately focused photos using the DSLRs in the day. So how did I go about doing that? Well, one of the key factors, apart from choosing your focus very carefully and make sure that the uh, pinpoint dot is right over the eye when you take a focus photo of someone, is also making sure your lenses were calibrated. So back in the day, that's what you had to do. You know, the lens the, there wasn't uh, phase detect on the sensor uh, focusing so sometimes one lens with a different camera body might have a slight out of focus perspective so you would have to fine tune that and there was an auto fine tune feature where you could adjust the focus maybe a little bit more back focusing or a little bit more forward focusing to get it exactly where you wanted it and raise the sharp every time and that was not a big deal it was actually quite a simple procedure let me just illustrate how simple that was and what I used to do so I would buy a new lens for example and uh, to in order to establish it to be uh, razor sharp and might have my absolute confidence in it all the time what I would do is I would put the camera up here not on the, obviously on this situation this is just a temporary way of illustrating what I would do but I would be outside maybe on a very long table uh, or floor I have the camera set up on a tripod so I know it's completely still and wasn't about to move around anywhere and I would have this so I use a test chart and you can see it there it's uh here we are test chart so I'm just trying to find somewhere where I'm not blocking it with equipment. But these uh, little test charts here were fantastic because they have little lines in them and uh, numbers and letters. And so what you do is you'd focus on this center bar area where it actually says there, I think, a uh, focus sharp area. You would focus on that little line. And of course, all the little fractions of a millimeter increments that are measured up here, like a little ruler, would illustrate if you were focusing forward or focusing back and you can make appropriate changes to get it fine-tuned exactly right. So what would you do? You'd put it something like this on that angle. You would have it on something like a 45 degree angle or even greater would be better. And what they would do is you'd take your photo and then if it was out, it would show up on the photo afterwards that it was a little bit forward or a little bit back and then you would make the fine-tuning adjustments in your menu. And you would program that and set it in so that, for example, your 180mm f2.8 prime was exactly uh, fine 
fine tune for your camera. And then if you're using a 50mm 1.8 prime, then that lens was fine tuned for your camera as well. And you never had any problem. When you would swap a lens over to your camera body, didn't matter what lens or what combination, you knew that that was already fine tuned and it was in the memory of the camera. So as soon as you used that combination, you were confident that it was going to be spot on focus every time. All you had to worry about was getting that little point of focus over the eye or the subject you were after, whatever the target was. And so this sort of a setup was what you would use back in the day. But uh, now, of course, with uh, the phase detect autofocus, you never have a trouble acquiring focus. As long as you get the point over the eye or pinpointed over the subject, it's going to be sharp every time. So that's a blessing for us, but it's no uh, disrespect to the DSLRs. You look, it took a bit more configuration to get everything perfect and fine-tuned, but you'd only do that once. Once you'd done it with that new lens you'd purchased or acquired, then that was it. It was already pro programmed in and was going to be sharp every time. So uh, I like the DSLR cameras. I'm not knocking them in any way. I may have moved over to mirrorless just because it's got a little bit of extra technology for me, which makes life a lot easier. But uh, that's no disrespect to the DSLR cameras and anybody who happens to be using them still. So uh, at the moment, what I like to do is always make sure that I have plenty of lighting. And that's the second thing with focusing that's really important. If the lighting is not good, this, the camera combination and lens can struggle to acquire focus. So even if the box does go green, it may or may not be spot on perfect focus, or you may end up with a grainy and uh, say less than desirable image anyway. So the trick is to always use lighting. Now whether that be a continuous LED lighting or a speed light or flash, doesn't really matter, but make sure you've got plenty of lighting on your subject. Now with the lenses I have here, this 50 uh, 1.2, that is so bright a lens that I've never have to worry about whether the subject is bright enough. My issue is though, is it bright enough on the pinpoint that I want to focus on? So the whole ambient photo area may be bright enough, yeah, but it doesn't mean that I'm making the face or the eye pop, uh, which you will if you use lighting. So this is what I'm going to encourage people to do, whether you're using something like this, <clears throat> and you can use this on camera, it is possible, just connect the, uh, I've got a uh, receive a trigger arrangement here so I can have the lights uh, off camera but if you're using it on camera that can be a big help especially if you're far enough away that it's not going to be harsh and very specular but it will aid you in your focus and also the uh, bringing the uh, subject to life and really making them pop and giving a nice sparkle in the eye for example the other option you can do I've shown you this before in other videos, but I have here a flash bender. Uh, I'm not saying this is the 10 out of 10 uh, piece de resistance of uh, all photography and lighting, but it's a system that works very well. So this here with a uh, trigger and a receiver arrangement, I can uh, have this out and I can shape it anywhere I like. When I'm taking a photo, if I need light directly above them, fine. If I want to make some angular light, I can also do that. And you can hold the... Uh, this lighting in one arm and then you can hold the camera in the other and take a photo should you wish or put it on a tripod or stand if that's available for you and it's appropriate where you are but the bigger softer life source you have the better that's going to be and the better aid it's going to be in making the subject pop and be sharp so you might have the uh, subject in focus but it still might be a bit of a soft and grainy photo simply because there isn't sufficient light on the subject and i can't emphasize how important it is to illuminate your subject so yes you can face them into the light uh, you can have them in direct sun, which is, of course, atrocious. Uh, it makes it too harsh and uh, almost blinding on the subject. Uh, so what I'd recommend you do is have them in the shade and have a good ambient light around you and then use something like a speed light, even if you turn it right down to a quarter power, just to give that little burst of light at that moment to really uh, make that uh, subject pop and be razor sharp and, and look beautiful. So I'll show you some photos, uh, illustrations. I've recently, if I just pick one up here, I just use this image here uh, for my new business card. So my business card isn't anything particularly special or glamorous other than I've got a beautiful couple in the front and my name and uh, my uh, website and information on the back. So uh, that subject there, that photo, I'll bring up on the screen for you a little larger so you can see what I'm talking about. And that's uh, an interesting illustration of getting things in focus because here we have a couple together. And uh, when you're using a, a prime lens, as I tend to do anyway, and you're, you're, you're trying to take a couple of people in the uh, photo, often you can have issues with them being at different points. So you, they're not necessarily like a one-dimensional image, are they? These people might have, one might have their head slightly forward, one might have their head slightly back, and then you've got an issue with trying to get both of them in focus. So what can we do to aid with that? Well, the simplest way to do it would be just to increase your F number, make it say F5.6 or F8, and definitely everything will be in focus. 
uh, that's that's a great option. However, it can uh, mean you've got a very harsh and uh, you know very uh, in focus background, which you may not want. You might want to soften that background and use maybe a a bigger uh, aperture, something like an f2 or an f1.4 or a 1.2 in this case, and really isolate your subject. Now, if you've got two people and you're trying to do that, that's hard work, but it's worth the hard work. And let me illustrate how you can achieve that. Now this photo was uh, shot at 2.8, the one I'm going to show you now. I have another one of them where I shot it at uh, 1.8. But the trick is simply to manipulate your subjects and take your time positioning them so if they naturally will always do this. This is quite a funny story, let me tell you. 100% of the time this is how they start off. You get a couple or a group of three or four into a photo and you say, right, we're going to take a photo and you'll get them all standing about this far apart from each other. You know, and it looks very uh, unkind. It looks like they hate each other's guts. So I always try and encourage them, bring them in close. Get them all together in a little bunch, like a bunch of flowers, I call it. Let's all get in and, and be, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder. And if I can get their heads touching or nearly touching, then that's even better. So uh, what you'll do is you'll get them as close in as you can. But you've got issues, of course, because you've got their shoulders. And the shoulders mean that they can't get their heads you know, together perfectly. So what you can do is you can angle them. You can have one sort of just behind or in front of the other. And then what you do is you get the one in front to just push their head slightly back. And then the person uh, that's at the back goes slightly forward. And what you're doing there is you're getting the plane of focus exactly straight. And then you can take your photo at a shallow depth of field and both of those uh, sets of eyes are going to be in focus. So it is a bit too time consuming. You've got to manipulate the subject. I'll often get up and look at them in profile and see exactly if their eyes are lined up together you know is it one's too far forward one too back but if you take your time to get them and make sure that they're exactly lined up then you go back you take that photo bang not only do you have a bright subject because you've used a good aperture nice bright one like say f 1.4 or 1.8 but uh, you've also got the eyes uh, in line and in focus and you've got a nice blurry background at the same time so exactly what f number you use it doesn't really matter but uh, always try and go as shallow as is reasonable and uh, particularly if it's two people in the subject then you've got to give yourself a little bit of grace so maybe 2.8 or something around there is as bad as shallow as you want to go but they say this photo was shot at f 2.8 and look how beautifully blurry that background background is. It looks fantastic. So that's that's an illustration. I have another uh, illustration of a photo I'll bring up of three little maids at a cosplay convention and I've had them sit down on the ground so they're nice and low and I've uh, got the lighting on them and you'll see there that I've had to manipulate them. So I've got the, the centre lady sitting in the front and then the girls either side of her with their heads very close. Now what they're doing is they're projecting their head slightly forward. The girl sitting in the middle, she's projecting her head just a little bit back and that evens up that plane of focus. So I can shoot three people in the shot at say f2.8 or even a little bit wider and still have them in focus and bright and a soft background. So it, look, it takes time, but it's definitely worth it. But in contrast to this, let me say, if you've got five or six people in the shot, then this is not going to happen. Two or three is about the maximum you can play around with this. After that, you've got to start really opening up your aperture. So, for example, this image here where I've got, I think it's five young ladies in a party, and they all wanted their photo taken together. So I've got them all lined up, and I've got them as you know straight as I can possibly get them, but also as close as I can get them practically. And then I've shot that one, I think, at f4.5. And that got them all in focus. They're all shot and they all feel included and in part of the shot. Now this is actually a big thing. If you're taking a photo of multiple people and you want them all in focus, you want them in focus for two reasons. One is it shows your level of competency, so you obviously are knowing what you're doing. But very importantly also, you want to have everybody feeling included. They don't want to have you know, Uncle Bob on the side there so blurred and out of focus he doesn't even look like he's part of the group. Everybody needs respect. You've got to give them all the same level of dignity. And if that means you have to open up your aperture to F8 to do that, then do that. But make sure everybody is in focus. It's so important, not only for your level of competency and respect and dignity in what you do, but you want to give your subjects respect and dignity and have them all feel included in the shot. So these are just a few things I really wanted to summarize very quickly about things you can do to get things in focus and, and really yeah, not only are you enjoying it more and feel more confident but the subjects that see your photos have that sense of dignity and pride in the photo as well. So please if you happen to be taking photos and you weren't fortunate enough to get them in focus then don't post them. That's, that's the key of it. 
If you can't get them in focus, then keep practicing until you can do it consistently and then post those photos. But in my opinion, an out of focus photo is not only showing your own level of incompetence and uh, disrespect, but it's also really insulting the client who was hoping to get that nice photo. And here's another trick. Can I just say this one more time? And that is take many photos. When you go to the, all the trouble of setting someone up to pose for a photo, whether it be an individual, whether it be a headshot, whether it be a group of five or six, don't just take one photo at one aperture. Take it at, say, 2.8. Take it at f4. Take the same photo at f5.6. Take it at f8. And then when you go home, you can sort through which one you think is the best arrangement. Now, let's say the one at f8 was the one where everybody's in focus and you're most happy with and they're all smiling and happy. It may be a darker photo. And the background might be very sharp and uh, a bit annoying. But this is where you can get into Photoshop later on. Use Lightroom, Photoshop, whatever you use, DaVinci Resolve. And then uh, process the photo there. Brighten up the image of the subjects and either darken and or blurry up the background, which you can do. It's a very simple procedure these days to mask the subjects that you want in focus. Keep them alive, keep them there. Go and invert that masking and uh, deal with the background. And you can darken it up or you can brighten it up or you can blur it, anything you want to. It doesn't always have to be done in camera. Some situations are just such that you can't do it in camera. There is no perfect arrangement where this particular aperture or this particular shutter speed or arrangement works for every situation. So please don't be scared to take multiple photos. Remember, every time you click the button, you take a photo, it costs nothing. It doesn't cost more to take 10 photos as it did to take one. So one of the key tricks to getting photos sharp and consistently good and pleasing everybody is just make them wait and take multiple photos. At least three is my recommendation of any time you do stop to take someone a photo. Look, you might be worried that they're getting impatient or they're getting frustrated. Yeah, I know, after a few photos, the smiles can sag slightly. You know, they're getting a little fidgety. But it's better to make them put up with that and keep asking them to uh, smile and get the photo sharp in the long run. Can I just say also that when I get people together, it's, it's a very valuable thing to play a little bit of a joke with them, tease them a bit, get them laughing and uh, relaxed. So what I'll often say to people, if I've got particularly a couple together, and the couples do, they don't know what to do. They're not always great at posing. So what you can do is I'll, I'll get them to stand in the position you want, and they're standing apart and looking a bit cold and, and straight on. So you've got to position them and encourage them and get them in close and tight and make it look like they're actually uh, happy to be there. And I'll often say things like them, now here's what I want you to do guys, I want you to pose together as close as you can and pretend as hard as possible that you actually like each other. And that usually gets a response and a laugh, particularly if they're in a relationship. So anything you can do to liven up the subject and get the point home of what you're trying to achieve for them, that's going to be really valuable. If you can get them on side to cooperate with the photo, that's going to make it a lot easier to get a sharp and accurate photo too. And let's not forget other points. Now, just one more thing. I'll, sorry, just getting out of frame there a little bit to pick something up. I have here a monopod. Now, whether you decide to use a monopod or a tripod or whatever happens to suit you in your particular circumstance and occasion, what I'm going to do is recommend that if you're not too sure about getting sharp photos or you've had any issue with that, there can be two elements of problems. One can be you. You might be moving around too much. So your sense, your sense of stabilization in your camera when activated does help a little bit with wobble. But if you're holding up a, a big lens, like something like a 70 to 200, and it weighs quite a lot, then uh, what can happen is your arms can get tired over time, and you might not even realize how much you're shaking and wobbling about. So just as a precaution, if it's possible to do so, take something like a monopod with you and use that to take all the weight. It does stop any up and down movement at all, because it's not going anywhere. No matter how much you push on that, it's not going up and down. And of course, it does give you more options to hold everything and, and frame the uh, camera better so it doesn't move around. And so that way, any movement is not you causing the movement, right? It's now only it may be the subject. So you've eliminated something that may have caused a blur and an out-of-focus photo. The other element is the subjects moving. Now, I've had many a subject, uh, you know, pose, and I've seen experienced models do this. Do you know what I'm doing here? I'm just sort of like slowly rocking back and forth. They don't often even realize they're doing it. It's a subliminal thing. They're just relaxed and chilling, and they don't realize that they're constantly rocking and moving about, not even paying attention to it. You can see it, and if you see it, by all means, pull them up on it. You know, not nasty, I'm not talking about you know, having a go at them. What I mean is just draw to their attention. So that they're wobbling around a bit. Could you please just try and balance yourself and be a little bit more still? I'll guarantee a sharper photo for you that way. 
And usually once it's brought to their attention, they're actually conscious about it. They go, oh, yes, I was a bit. And then they can straighten themselves up and be firm. And once they pose and they're firm and, and in control like that, you're definitely guaranteed at least that they're not moving. Because it doesn't matter how good the sensor stabilization is in your camera or how good your tripod and monopod are, if the subject is moving around without really realizing it, then they're going to have a blurry image because you're going to struggle to keep focus on them. So that's really all the tips I've got for you today. I uh, do encourage, of course, let's just review some of them. One is use the stabilization where possible, whether that be in body or whether it be a monopod or tripod. Definitely use lighting. Lighting is important in getting a sharp and high resolved image. So don't underestimate the importance of using some sort of a speed light or continuous LED lighting. And also, uh, very importantly, if you can possibly manually position that focus point over the eye or on the uh, target of the subject, then you're probably guaranteed a lot better chance of nailing focus exactly where you want it. And this becomes very critical specifically if you're using something with a very big aperture like a 1.4 or 1.2 lens. Uh, getting that critical focus exactly over the eye is essential. Having a face in focus means nothing. If their face is sideways and you're focused on the wrong eye or on their forehead or on their chin or nose and you've missed the eye, it'll show up so obviously in a tight end headshot that you'll be absolutely horrified at uh, how the photo looks, how blurry and messy it is. So take your time getting that focus point Guarantee the thing actually goes green or whatever color you've chosen to make sure you've got focus. And then when you're confident everything is working, then take the photo and take several photos. If you keep refocusing and taking a shot, refocusing, taking the shot, and even changing the apertures up a bit, mixing that up at the same time, you are guaranteed a great photo and a sharp option every time. So thank you once again for your time. I hope I haven't been a bit condescending. I've tried my best to be respectful to everyone. Uh, I think this is just a really important subject and I hope I've been in some way helpful to you. So you will have a good day and thank you for your time and help.